Um, so uh, let me try to give you an overview of what I want to do. So in the first lecture, I would like to introduce the geometric setting that there is for geometric recursion, and I call those uh, pre target theories. And then I will give you 15 examples of those. And then I will give you the definition of geometric recursion for any target theory. Uh, I will then show you an example of a target theory where I will do all of the things in detail, so that will be Teichmann theory. And then I will show a Miyazakani McShane example of geometric recursion. <coughs> and so that's the one we call Miyazakani McShane geometric recursion. I will then show you what we call Kansevich's example, uh, which is another example, which is actually not very far away from the Miyazakani McShane example. And then I would like to go and show you the example of summing over multi-curves in terms of geometric uh, recursion. And finally, I want to discuss what is the relation between topological and geometric recursion for the specific target theory that's type of theory. Okay. And so tomorrow, well, I'll give you a short recap of definition of geometric recursion. I will then give you the actual detailed definition of the target theory. So I will give you a watered-down definition today in order to somehow let you get into it. And then tomorrow I'll give the details. I will also give some remarks on the proofs tomorrow. And then I will show you the example of measure beach volumes, uh, which we call the measure beach example of geometric recursion. Then I will give you an example from closed uh, screen uh, field theory using geometric recursion. And finally, I want to introduce the open geometric recursion. And then I want to show you how the open geometric recursion actually gives you a recursion for computing statistics of eigenvalues of the directly Neumann Laplace to Trami operator. And so this the last thing here actually solves a problem, I think, that has a very long history and has been open yeah, for a long time. And it has also interest in string theory. And it will be able to answer questions like, which percentage of the moduli space of curves has the directly or the Neumann Laplace operator, the Laplace Beltrami operator, with the property that there is an eigenvalue in between 0 and 1, or 1 and 2, and so on, any number you like. So, this is a deep problem and analysis that can be handled via this recursion. Okay, uh, then a couple of sort of buzzwords to maybe ans answer questions like. What is the relation between geometric and topological recursion? What's the difference? And if you want a buzzword for that, you could say that geometric recursion is a kind of categorification of topological recursion. And I, I think it would be clear what I mean in the end. But it's kind of geometric recursion is set in a much broader setting than topological recursion. Okay. So let me try to get started. So I'd like you to consider the category of compact oriented surfaces. So these are simply just surfaces. In, and so since I'm playing, maybe talking to an algebraic geometry audience, maybe I should draw the ones that I mean. They are not algebraic geometry surfaces, but just real surfaces, two dimensional, say something like this, formal sphere, with boundary. So it's a two dimensional manifold with boundary of some genus with a number of boundary components. Okay, so that's the kind of compact oriented surfaces I want. The morphisms are just isotopic classes of different morphisms. And then uh, there is another category, that's the category of uh, vector spaces. And then a pre target theory is simply a function from surfaces to vector spaces. So just something that assigns a vector space to every surface. Okay, that's easy. It's not compact to support the different. Or uh, so my, my surfaces are compact. But can the, the different morphism can rotate the boundaries? Yes. Right now they can. Very soon we will have them frozen in the boundaries. At least they will freeze a, a point on the boundary. But right now I'm just the less I say in the beginning, the easier it is to understand the concept. Okay. And also you don't want points on the boundary. Not so far, but there will be points a little later. So uh, what I'm in particular interested in is, is a functorial assignment of a vector in the vector space for the surface, for any surface. 
And of course, if it's a functorial assignment, I notice that this vector will lie in the mapping class group invariant part of this vector space. And so that's the that's the geometric setting in which geometric recursion is working. Yeah, and so you might think, oh well, that's very restrictive. It's a funny setting and so on. But let I, I actually claim that many constructions in geometry and topology that involve surfaces fits in this framework. And so let me give you the 15 examples. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one is I take the vector space that's associated to a surface to be all continuous functions on Teichmuller space of the surface. So remember that uh, the Teichmuller space of a surface, this is simply just the set of diffeomorphisms phi from the surface to some Riemann surface with boundary. Okay, sorry, I should say a squiggly line here. Modulo some equivalence relation. And what's the equivalence relation? Well, if I have two diffeomorphisms phi1 that goes to C1, and I have phi2 that goes to C2, then I ask that there exists a bihomorphism phi such that this diagram here commutes up to isotopy. That is the uh, type of space of the surface. It covers the moduli space of curves, right? The mapping class group of the surface acts on this, and the quotient is the moduli space of curves. Well, in this case here, I'm looking at Riemann surfaces with boundaries. But if I were to look at the case where there's no boundary, then I get exactly moduli space of curves. So the curves Yes, so if you think of this in terms of hyperbolic geometry, these would be hyperbolic metrics on the surface with geodesic boundaries. No, that's right. I mean, if you want a hyperbolic uh, description, it is only for, as you know, negative oil characteristic surfaces. And actually, I will mainly be working with negative oil characteristic surfaces that will be clear in a second. <coughs> so I take continuous functions on this space here as you see over here. And then I take a very, very simple function. I take the function one inside uh, this uh, continuous function. That's clearly mapping class group invariant. And you may think this example is utterly useless and uninteresting. But the moment that we actually built this function one using geometric recursion, you will see that it's a form, it works as a kind of partition of unity. And so actually, the Miyazakani Machine identity lies behind of getting this from geometric recursion. Okay, now I take something a little bit more interesting. I now want to take sums over simple closed multi-curves on the surface. So remember that a simple closed, well, I'm going to switch the color here. So a simple closed, sorry, multi-curve. So, so S sigma here, this is the set of first ones multi-curves. And so multi-curves are just embedded one-dimensional manifolds inside the surface, say this one here, or this one here, or the union of the two, these are multi-curves. And the point is that we only consider them up to isotopy, they're not allowed to intersect each other, each curve is simple, and none of them, none of the components are isotopic to a boundary component. That's exactly what's happening. That L sigma is the length function with respect to the uh, metric? Yeah. <coughs> so, uh, so, so I just wanted to first tell you what this is. So all the words that says here is what I just said on the board. And so what do we do? Well, you take a function from the positive reals to the complex numbers, which decays sufficiently fast at infinity. So for example, if it has exponential decay at infinity, it's fine. And then what you do is you say, let's sum over all the multi-curves. And for each multi-curve, you take a product over the components. So in this case, here, there's two components, that one and that one, right? And then what you do is you, at some point in Teichmuller space, you compute the length of the component, and you apply f to the length. Take the product, sum over all multi-curves. Is there a version of this for measured line analysis? <coughs> yeah, there is. There is, but uh, yeah, I just but wanted to do this. curve to go from one boundary component to the other. In this case, I'm not doing that. I'm just doing all the internal. So um, this is a nice continuous function on Teichmuller space if f has sufficiently fast decay. Certainly much more interesting than these, right? Okay. And it's sort of a, a, been an open question, how do you integrate these functions here? So in other words, how do you get statistics of length of simple closed curves? 
So for example, if I were to say f here is the indicator function of things that, uh, so it's one on the interval from one to two and zero elsewhere, certainly that's fast decaying at infinity. And so I get some function here, and now I can ask the same question, if I average this function over moduli space of curves, what would I get? And so in, uh, I will get some number, and this number is telling you which percentage, if you normalize the respect to the volume of the moduli space, which percentage of the curves has a simple closed curve, you know, in the range between, uh, of length between one and two. I can't hear you. No, no, you don't get the probability that you this you get some mean value of this. Yeah, you get, sorry, you get the mean value, but if you want other moments, you have to you change your function, right? That's right. Okay. All right. So, another more interesting example is if you take uh, the Plas Beltrami operator, and since I have a boundary, you can either take the Rickley or Neumann boundary conditions. And then you can uh, look at the spectrum of this guy and you can apply some function that is fast decaying again to the spectrum and take the trace. And this will be a well-defined continuous function on type of space. And so that's the guy that I will try to deal with tomorrow in terms of understanding averages of this guy. And that's what I was alluding to before. If you again take an indicator function on some interval, you will have the percentage of the moduli space that has eigenvalues in that interval by doing this. Okay, so uh, those are three examples that just involves one target theory, namely continuous functions on time and space. And so, sorry, I, I misspoke, it's a pre-target theory, right? You will see why, what, what target theories are in a second. Okay, so now I want you to look at another target theory, and in this case here I want two forms on time and space. And the particular two form I'm interested in is the Bay Peterson symplectic form on type of space. So, as you know, if I take a surface, something like this, maybe it has a genus like that, and then I take a pair pants decomposition of the surface, so something like this, then I will get length functions, in this case here, three length functions, L1. L2 and L3. And of course, if I fix a base point in the moduli or in the cycle of space, I will also get twist coordinates, theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3. And of course, I also have the lengths and the boundaries, right? L1, L2, and L3. So if I, and now I'm thinking hyperbolic geometry. So if I fix L1, L2, and L3, I get something that is a symplectic space and that symplectic space, you know, the Ray Peterson symplectic form, is simply just sum d l i, which d theta i, i equals one to, in this case, three. Which is a symplectic form because the space is not necessarily even dimensions that have the fixed length of boundary. That's what it is. And I just said that. Just so it is probably not, you can't hear it like what you're saying. So I have to fix L1 and L2 okay. and L3 to fix values, and then it's a symplectic space. Okay. So again, it's Poisson, and it's symplectically five yeah. over length yeah. or boundary. Okay, yeah, good. So then uh, that's one example. Of course, it's Markman class group invariant. I mean, it's actually not clear from this expression why it's Markman class group invariant, right? But it's a theorem it is, and there's another construction of it that makes it manifest. And it actually involves the next example. So if you look at Bayer's complex structure on Teichmann space, then I think of that as an almost complex structure. So in other words, an almost complex structure, that is a section of the endomorphism bundle of the Teichmann space. It's the same objection. Same objection. Yeah. Yes, and now I, I agree. <laughs> Completely. <laughs> Yes, I agree, I agree. So it, this here is actually just for closed surfaces. Yeah, okay. But same story again, right? I mean, you can fix the boundaries. But okay, this here is for closed surfaces. I agree. Okay. And so, of course, a, 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 a complex structure satisfies many things. It squares to minus the identity, and it is integrable. But I didn't take into account that when I considered this vector space here. And that's because I would like to have vector space where I can sum things for obvious reasons in a moment. 
And so, although this guy said as many conditions, I, I just don't care about it, I just think of it as inside this vector space. Okay? And so, uh, just if anybody's wondering, what is this complex structure? Well, it's simply that if you look at a, a point in time of space sigma, and you take the tangent space to it, and now I'm indeed assuming that there is no boundary, so this is empty, well, then um, uh, the complex structure is simply given by, you look at the tangent, so, so this tangent space is isomorphic to uh, H1 of the surface, of the Riemann surface there, and then you take the anti you take the canonical bundle inverse, and so this one here has just, you know, multiplication by I. And that's the complex structure, when you identify the tangent space with the space. So, so this is just the complex structure at that point. Okay. And of course, that's also marking class with invariant. Very good. Next thing is, uh, well, let's consider the situation where we want to have closed marking class group invariant forms on tight corner space. Well, then the, uh, the vector space I associate is simply all forms on tight corner space. I could also say all closed forms if I want to. And then somehow the vector I have is some closed form, which is marking class group invariant. And, of course, what, what I'm, I'm particularly interested in here is such forms that represent non-trivial cohomology classes on the marginalized space of curves. Because uh, we know some constructions of forms like this uh, uh, at the moment. Namely, we know constructions for all the stable cohomology of the marginalized space. But we know very few such constructions for odd degree forms. Okay? And these marginalized spaces are actually negative order characteristics. So there's lots more odd than even. So there's a lot more things to try to actually find. Okay. Next one is uh, fog roughly uh, Poisson structure. So this really works for all surfaces, also the open ones. It realizes that if you take the moduli space of flat G connections, where G is some semi-simple Lie group, either complex or real, you can construct a bivector. And this bivector is the uh, fork grossly poisson structure, and of course it's a mapping class group invariant object on the modulized space and flat connections. Okay, uh, let me show you a sort of even more complicated example. Namely, if you consider the narashiman shishakri family of complex structures on the modulized space of flat connections, but now you have to, of course, fix conjugacy classes at all the boundary components. Because if you fix those conjugacy classes, this space here is really symplectic. And if you fix a point in Teichmuller space, then the narashima shatri theorem tells you that that induces a section of the endomorphism bundle, of the tangent bundle of this moduli space, in such a way that it is an integrable complex structure. And so that whole family of complex structures, we normally think about it, parameterized by Teichmuller space, is really just an element in this vector space here. So that's another one. The Ricci potential on the modulized space of flat connections with the fixed holonomy is the same thing. So the Ricci potential is the following guy that uh, so Ricci potential. So that's if you look at the Ricci 1 1 form on this Keeler manifold, then you can take its harmonic decomposition, and so it will be something times the symplectic form on these modulized spaces plus some exact 1-1 one, one form. And in fact, this exact 1-1 one, one form can be written as 2i d d bar on the moduli space of some function f. But of course, everything here depends on the point in Teichmuller space. So this doesn't, but these two here does, because the complex structure on the moduli space depends on the point in Teichmuller space. So this f here becomes something that depends on the point in Teichmuller space, sigma is a point in Teichmuller space. So in other words, uh, this Ricci potential becomes a function from Teichmuller space that takes values in smooth functions on the moduli space, and it is exactly given by a solution to this equation. And if you want to normalize this, so this only defines this function up to a constant, you could, for example, say that the average of this function is zero. So there's a unique function that solves this equation here. There's actually an explicit formula for this function in, by the work of uh, Taktajan and Sograf for this function. But that's also an example. Maybe I go a little faster. So, of course, there is also Hitchin's hyperkähler structure on the moduli space of parabolic Higgs bundles. Fits in this as well. Now we have a, an element of this huge vector space here. 
Og <coughs> rather funnily, uh, two, two, two funny examples here. If you take an invariant of a closed oriented three manifold, you can also view this this way. And that's the reason for this is the following that if you take your surface, and now I'm working with closed surfaces here, so you take some closed surface like this, then a heat guard diagram, right, is the set of two sets of curves on the surface. So maybe one set is like this. They are always like that. They are standard, standard sets, right? The two, because they are sets that give you handle body. So one is like this. That gives you the handle body you kind of see in front of you here on the board. And then maybe the other one is like this. So like that. So these two, so that's two, sorry. I just was doing a lot of moving forward with this one here. So these two are two systems of curves. You know, they are Hika, this is a Hika diagram. And any three manifold can be represented by a Hika diagram like this. And we have the Singer theorem that's telling you when two Hika diagrams give you the same three manifold. And so therefore, if I simply define some uh, vector space, say, uh, so I define E of sigma to be just the span, say, over the complex numbers of this set of Hika diagrams, and then take the dual, well, then I get, obviously, an element in the dual of that vector space simply by taking whatever alpha comma beta is, you send it to the invariant applied to the corresponding three main. So that gives you an element in this dual vector space. It's clearly Markman class group invariant because this whole association of the three manifold to the Hika diagram is Markman class group invariant. Same thing for four manifolds. So if you consider smooth closed oriented four manifolds, well then by the Gay Kirby theorem, all of them can be obtained via a trisection diagram. So now I don't have two sets of curves like this, I have three sets of curves like that. And Kirby and, uh, Gay and Kirby proved that all smooth, closed, oriented four manifolds has such a diagram, and it also moves between those. It's not so relevant for us right here. But then I just do exactly the same. I take this free vector space band by trisection diagrams, and then I4 here is considered an element in the dual by just doing this thing here. Okay. Here's uh, one that's maybe particular of interest to this audience here. Let's consider, you know, closed forms of relevance to flow home uh, cohomology and for Kaya categories. So I start with a symplectic manifold. Then I take I, a generic, almost complex structure, which is compatible with omega. So it means that, uh, you know, I is tame with respect to omega. That means if I combine omega and I, I get a metric, positive definite Riemannian metric on M. I then pick a Lagrangian subvariety of M. And then I look at the Teichmuller space of pseudo-holomorphic maps from this surface to Mi. So of course this depends on picking a complex structure on sigma and then looking at the map, pseudo-holomorphic map for that complex structure, right? But this is going to be some construction that sort of, you know, works in, in a Teichmuller way, just like here, where I just consider such parameterizations together with the maps. So that gives me what I call the Teichmuller space of pseudo-holomorphic maps from sigma to this manifold with respect to I, and I require that the boundary of the surfaces go to the Lagrangian. And now, of course, I have the usual evaluation maps. If I look at this Teichmuller space, there is an evaluation map from that to the nth Cartesian tensor power of L itself, simply just given with, if you pick a element in the configuration space of the boundary of size n, so here now I start have points on the boundary, then that gives me, you know, evaluate the, the curve or the, this, this, this element of the space at those at points. I get maps to n copy of L. And if I have now n forms on L, I can pull them back, say they're closed. If I want closed forms, then I can just pull them, I mean, wedge them together on this Cartesian product and then pull them back with respect to the evaluation map. And then indeed, of course, I get something that lives in the target theory, where the target theory is forms on that type of space. <coughs> and these are, of course, highly relevant for various things like, you know, for cohomology and for Kaya Okay. All right. So I, there are lots of examples. I mean, that was just 15. I tell you, there are many, many more. Okay. So let's, let's be a little bit more precise about what I want to do here. 
So now I'll give you some more details about the domain and the target category that I want to use. <coughs> so the category of surfaces I want to use is compact oriented surfaces of negative Euler characteristic with a mark point on each of the boundary components together with an orientation of the boundary such that I split the boundary into in components and out components and such that if I look at the inclusion of the in into the surface that induces an isomorphism from pi ones like this that is just code word for saying the following so let me draw some examples over here so if I so there's one in boundary and then there's some out boundaries and the out boundaries they could be empty if I want to but they might not as in this example here then I have mark points on the boundary like this and the last statement is simply just saying that each component has one in boundary so if I have two guys here for example this one here which would be of particular interest to us a pair of hands then there are now two in boundaries, namely that one and that one, corresponding each to exactly one component of the surface. Okay, and then uh, the morphisms, they will be isotopic classes of orientation preserving diffeomorphisms, which preserves the mark points and orientations on the boundaries, modulo isotopics, which also preserve all that structure. So the DFO has to preserve the mark points on the boundary, and it has also to preserve the class of in and out, and then up twice as well. Okay, so that is the domain category that I want to work with precisely. Now the target theory, I mean now what, what, what should I take values in? So I'd like to take values in the following. So the objects will be housed off, complete, locally convex topological vector spaces over the complex numbers. So all of the examples I gave you are exactly of this type. So I mainly have infinite dimensional vector spaces in mind here. You can of course do finite dimensional if you also want to do that, but it's, it's really a theory that's I think geared mainly, mainly to infinite dimensional spaces. That's why I'm worried about the topology of the vector spaces. Yes. So is it easy to make this uh, forms on the last technical space that you define? Yeah. Yes, it's not so hard. It's not because there are fresher spaces, and fresher spaces are <laughs> examples of these. And then morphisms are just morphisms of locally convex topological vector spaces. And then what I call a pre-target theory is simply just a functor from that category to this category. Okay. That's a pre-target theory. Good. So here is the sort of main page of the slides. So it's a little dense, but it has all, the, all it, it has in, in principle the definition of geometric recursion. So, I'm thinking that I have a functor, so I have, th I have a pre-target theory, so I have such a functor here. And now what I want to do is I want to recursively <coughs> define for every object sigma in this, so for every surface of the type that I just discussed, an element, a vector, inside a vector space, mapping class group invariant part. I want to do this recursively in the Euler characteristic. The basic idea is to recursively remove pair of pants, like you see over here in yellow. And these pair of pants should be embedded in the surface, and they should be embedded around the in boundary on the surface. And so when I remove such a pair of pants, what's going to happen is that the Euler characteristic goes up by one, because the Euler characteristic of a pair of pants is minus one. And so if I'm only working with negative Euler characteristic surfaces, I'm going to end with Euler characteristic minus one at some point in the recursion. And that means I have a pair of pants or I have a one hole torus. Those are the only two surfaces of my type that uh, I end with. Okay, and so notice there was actually three types of cases. The first case here is where the embedding of the pair of pants shares two boundary components with the surface. So, so let me just draw that over here. So that, that's a situation <coughs> that I can just I can just add that in here. So for example if I take this curve here, 
as, as the third curve on a pair of hands, then uh, it's a B-type because it has two boundaries in common with the surface. And so if I'm thinking of this map in here, then there are actually, so, so, so this, is, this is the in. So the in has to go to the in. But then there are two choices uh, for mapping this onto that. I can map this guy here onto this, or I can map this guy onto the red. So if I put a little B here for on one of the two out boundaries, then that B, say, is the one that goes here. So that's my notation. So that's if you see some up B <coughs> in the future, like you see an up B here, it's because there are actually two cases for the B case. Namely, one of the two outs will have to go to a bound. Okay, and then two choices. All right. So, this is an inside remark, relevant in a second. But else there is the C case, and the C case just means that both of the out boundaries of my pair of hands goes to the surface interiorly. And then, of course, there are two cases in those. Does it split the surface into something that's disconnected when I remove the pair of hands, like there? Or does it keep the complement connected? OK. So now, in order pr to proceed with this recursion here, well, certainly I have to have some pre-target theory. But my pre-target theory now has to have more structure for this to work. Because notice that in this case here, I disconnect the surface. So if I, have, if I have a possibility to do something for connected surfaces, I have to somehow induce something on disconnected surfaces. And so what I want to require is simply just that if I have two arbitrary surfaces, I want a disjoint union morphism, which is a bilinear map from the vector space of one surface across the vector space of the other surface to the disjoint union. So if I know how to do things for connected guys, I can just stick those vectors in here and map them over, and I will get something for the disconnected guy. So obviously the disjoint union morphism has to be natural with respect to disjoint union diffeomorphisms. morphisms. That's one thing. But I also have to have something that has to do with gluing, right? Because I'm gluing this pair of hands. If I think of it reverse, after I have removed it, then I'm gluing this pair of hands onto the complement and get the surface I'm working with right now. So therefore, if I look at any subset of the out of the first surface and the in of the second surface, and this subset is just disjoint pairs that I want to glue on. So if I make a little drawing over here, uh, so suppose that uh, I have another surface here, which has two in boundaries here, say, and another guy here with two in boundaries. Then this beta is just telling me that I want to do these two and these two, say, I glue these two together, and of course I do it in such a way that the mark points go to mark points. And so I pick some diffeomorphism of this boundary to that boundary that makes the maps the mark point to the mark point and respects orientation, same here. That's the beta information. So I can glue those up to get a closed surface. And once I'm given this gluing information, I would like to have a gluing morphism, which is here called theta beta, that goes from the, it's a bilinear map, E of one surface, E of the other surface, to the glued, to the glue, E of the glued surface. So a pre-target theory together with such morphisms here is called a target theory. Okay, and so beyond the target theory, of course, I have to start somewhere. I need also starting data. And the starting data is, you know, when I end up with a pair of hands or a one-hole torus, I can't go any further in recursion, so I need starting data. And A here will be an element <coughs> in the vector space of the pair of hands, mapping class group in right part, and D will be an element in the vector space of the to one-hole torus, mapping class group in right part of that, and I'm going to just simply assign you know, omega p to be a and omega t to be d. So that's my start of the recursion. <coughs> but you see, then in, in when I'm recursing, I also need to have something for the pair of pants, right? I could have chosen a to just be there, but this would not be smart, okay? Because then it would limit the, recur the recursion way too much. I have an ability to actually say, no, no, I want a recursion data B, which is totally independent of A, and I only use that when I recurse, like what you see here. 
And also I have a C, and actually C, there are two possibilities, right? There is whether the complement is connected or disconnected. But in order to align up well with the <coughs> Bertrand's topological recursion, I will ignore the difference and use the same C for this case and this case. And that means that I end up with a recursive definition that says the following. <coughs> Take the set of pair pants of, of embeddings of pair pants of this type, to be PB, and so it is the set of isotopic classes of embeddings of the pair pants into the surface of type B, and this is the set of isotopic classes of embedding of type C into the surface. So these two are countable sets, and so now I want to perform the sum over these two countable sets of, well, in this case here, you take the B for that guy, you use the gluing morphism, and you combine it with what you inductively have already defined because it has higher, higher Euler characteristic. And so you want to do this sum and you want to do that sum here, you stick in the C, glue on these two boundaries, B and B prime in this case. So actually the notation is that for pair pants, if one is B, the other one is B prime on the other, so there. And so this is all fine, right? So this guy here is good to go. Problem of course is that, um, <coughs> These two are infinite sums, so I have to do some analysis to make this work. And, but if I can make it work in such a way that these two sums here are absolutely convergent, then they won't change their value if I reorder the, uh, the summation ranges. And that's all the mapping class group is doing. So therefore, if these are mapping class group invariant, <coughs> and I make sure this sum here is absolutely convergent, this guy will be mapping class group invariant. So that's the aim, okay? All right, so this is the definition of geometric recursion. Just this one here. So, sorry, could there not be more than one point marked in the boundary? In the boundary? Not in today's talk. Oh, so you didn't say that, okay. There has yeah. to be exactly one. Sorry, uh, yeah. Maybe I didn't spell it out, but with a marked point on each boundary component. Okay, okay, no, I'm yeah. just... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, this would precisely one per boundary component. So that's what I meant. Tomorrow I will do surfaces with corners, and then there will be many marked points in the boundaries, as many as corners on the surface. Okay, so now... So, in other words, we have to talk about admissible initial data. So initial data for a given target theory will be A and C in there, B, B in there, where B is the choice of this out here, so there is two choices, right? But I want it in such a way that if I have an element of the mapping class with a pair of pants that interchanges those two bounded components, then it should work this way in the piece. And then I have D, which lies in this space here, one or two. So that's the initial data by definition. And then the initial data is called admissible if A, B, C, D satisfies certain decay properties. And I will give you precisely what these decay properties are tomorrow. Today I would like to uh, not give them to you. It's technical. So uh, I want to, rock, to just shove the analysis under the rock at the moment. So then I think. Uh, makes it a little easier to, to grasp the first time around. So, therefore the recursion runs, of course, the following way. You start with initial data, you start with a target theory, and then you assign to the empty surface one inside the vector space of the empty surface, which is the field that you're working over. For a pair of pants, you assign A. For one whole torus, you assign D. And then for all surf connected surfaces of Euler characteristic less than minus two, you run this recursion here. And now you see all of a sudden a half. A half is again due to uh, Bertrand, so line up with him later on. <laughs> so that's the, for me, there is no reason why this half could be there. Okay. If you like, there are two cases of this type. But anyway. So, and then for disconnected surfaces, you use the disconnected morphism to define it uh, just on each piece. And then you yeah, I would also, 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 I would
is that this assignment here is well defined. More precisely, the above series defining this guy converges absolutely for any of the seminorms that define the topology of this vector space here. And it is functorially, in particular, it's Markov classical regard. So I will give you tomorrow the details on how this goes. This is just some of the decomposition of triple of that. Yes. Yes, all of you. So basically, it just iterates to all possible sums of pairs and yes. order. But you order them a little bit from the inbound. Yeah. yeah. So it's not just uh, uh, just take all sums that you like. They order in some way. But that's that. If you just took some all sums that you like, it would give, it would give a different result. Okay. All right. So let me just give you a little bit about the idea of why this works. And plant the seed in your mind, and then tomorrow I'll give you all the gory details. <laughs> But the basic idea is the following. Go back to S sigma, which is Thurston set of multicurves. And the first thing you notice actually is that this pair of pans up to isotopy, the embedding of the pair of pans actually just determined by the isotope class of this curve here. And likewise, if I look at the C case, there are, it's a multicurve with two components. So actually, they're just determined by an element in the S, this S sigma here with these multicurves. So now, Imagine that you have some kind of function defined on multicurves to R plus. In other words, you have some weird way of associating lengths to these multicurves. One very well known way would be hyperbolic geometry. So if you had a hyperbolic metric on the surface, that would give you a very nice function. But another way could be something completely different. I don't care which way it is, but what I would like to happen is that there exist two constants that depend only on the surface in such a way that if I look at the number of multicurves which has length less than some capital L, then I want that to grow no faster than the power of L. And the power should be this D sigma. D sigma. So that certainly happens for hyperbolic geometry. If you have a hyperbolic metric on the surface, this is satisfied. I think this is a theorem of Rabin that was, you know, uh, refined considerably by Miyazaki. Okay, but we assume that we have such length functions. If you have such length functions, well, if you look at the set, all set of pair pans, then you can actually define this function here. You just sum over all pair pans of type B, you take the length of the pair pan, what does the length of the pair pan mean? Just the length of the boundary curve in the interior, and then you lift that to minus S. And so if S is bigger than this constant here plus one, this will be a fine function. Right. In fact, it will even be holomorphic in S in that region. Okay, and now imagine that we are somehow able to show that the gluing map combined with whatever the initial condition on B is, in terms of decay, that if you take the norm of this glued object here, then that's less than the constant times the norm of this guy times the length of P to this power. If that's the case, you will immediately see that if I take the absolute series associated to the thing I had before, right? So, sorry, I just want to go back to So we have this sum of all of these. Now I just take the absolute series associated to that. So I bring the norm inside and I sum over these. If I use this norm estimate here, what I will get is that I will get a bound like that. And that's telling you that this series is absolutely convergent. So in other words, the whole story tomorrow will be to set up a theory that exactly does something like this and get this absolutely convergent this way. Same thing for C, of course. This was the B case. OK, good. So now just a little bit of a story about how does this connect to the rest. So of course, this is extremely highly inspired by that topological recursion and further work of Maxim and Jan. So first of all, topological recursion, if I'm not wrong, an expert should correct me, but as far as I understand it, was invented by Chekhov in Art and Lorentin in around this time here, <laughs> but it was written down explicitly by Bertrand and Nicolai. <coughs> it takes as input a spectral curve, as we have seen from Bertrand's lecture yesterday, and then a one form on the spectral curve and a two form on a twofold product of the spectral curve. And Bertrand showed for us explicitly <coughs> how this, for all non negative integers g and n, produces, a, a, if you take the n fold product of the spectral curve with itself, then the recursion gives you 
in a way that's very reminiscent of the irreducible components of the boundary of the divisor, it produces for you, I hope I wrote this somewhere, or maybe I'm reading this wrong, it produces these forms on N4 products of a spectral curve, right? The omega GNs that Bertrand uh, defined for us in his talk. Okay, but then the subsequent development was that Konsevich and Soibermann in 2016 to 17 uh, introduced what's called quantum array structures. These quantum array structures, they take as their input infinite, or maybe infinite tensors, they could also be finite in their setting, but four tensors, A, B, C, D. And of course the A, B, C, D is reminiscent of my A, B, C, D from before. And with this data, they specify and quantize the certain Lagrangian quadratic subvariety of a symplectic vector space. And what one can say is that if you start with any initial data for TR, for topological recursion, one can construct ABCD, which gives a quantum area structure in the sense of Conservius and Soibermann, in such a way that the output up here is encoded in their general construction of the quantization of this chronic Lagrangian. But when the curve is this A curve, or is it? Yes. Or so, is it? Uh, I forget what. What is ABCD for the area curve? No, it's complicated stories. Yes. No, no, just but this statement is just when the spectral curve from topological recursion is the area curve. No, no, no. <laughs> this is for any spectral curve. The area curve is one example of topological recursion. You, for any spectral curve, you have topological you, recursion. You can say that every structure is not every curve. Yeah. This, I, the, the word here is inspired by the fundamental first example of topological recursion, which is the one that went from first, the area curve. <coughs> and uh, maybe you can say why... It's a quadratic Lagrangian, and that the yeah. human base form of cubic functions. Yeah. It's that kind of Fourier transform. Yes. 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 But, but it transforms the form of cubic functions secretly around it. Yeah. Okay. Right. But uh, one shouldn't be misled to think that it only relates to the area curve in topological recursion. Actually, any spectral curve gives A, B, C, D in the type you want in such a way that one can run the quantum area program and get the same output as one gets from a topological recursion. And so the geometric recursion is something that uh, we developed, uh, and Romantin and myself, and we did that sort of in this period here, 15 to 18 about, and our first version of this geometric recursion was actually based on the spectral curve technology. But then in the meantime, Conservatives and Soibermann came out with, the, with this quantum area structure paper, and that sort of inspired us to change to the formalism of ABCD that you see here. And then you see geometric recursion is rather different than topological recursion because it involves functorial objects associated to surfaces of genus G with n number of boundary components. Whereas these forms up here somehow are just associated to the integer G and the integer N. Okay, so that's one big difference. But I will show you below, so soon now, that actually we can map GR to TR for the very special case where the target theory is type number space see now. And actually any occurrence of TR we can map to GR in the case of the target theory type. So I'll show you that now. So I don't know if I've gone too slow with this. Yeah, certainly. Ah, okay, so what I want to do now is show you the target theory for type number space. And so remember that I now don't just have surfaces with no mark points on the boundary. Now I actually have mark points, one on each boundary component. And so the type Miller space that I want is again diffeomorphism from a surface to a border Riemann surface, but the equivalence relation is different. Because I say that two such maps are equivalent if there exists a biholomorphism from the first Riemann surface to the second, in such a way that when I go around this diagram here again, this commutes up to isotopy, but what kind of isotopy? Well, it's restricts to the identity on the mark points, first of all, this composition here. And the isotopy is to the identity via diffeomorphism that also restricts to the mark points by the identity. So all the, all the maps are the identity of the mark points. So, so I have these mark points and I really insist now that, oops, that, uh, you know, that 
they all, these marked points are preserved in the isotopies and in these diagrams. Okay. Very good. So the thing is that, of course, there is a canonical map from this Teichmuller space. I call this Teichmuller space up P for marked points. So there's a map here. You can just relax the equivalence relation, right? The sense is the same, but the equivalence relation is stronger. So if I just relax the equivalence relation, I get a map from here to here. And in fact, this map here is simply just an R bundle to the number of bonded components. And so what you can do here is that you can basically just twist a certain amount around each bonded component. And because I have this mark point here, this doesn't want to twist. So I have a, an R bundle over the usual type model space. And then, if, of course, I have the Dean twist, which are parallel to the boundary. So if I just look at the Dean twist in the curve that's just sitting parallel to a boundary component, that acts on the space, and it acts now <coughs> non-trivially. But if I divide that action out, I get a new space, which is called the same thing, except there's a twiddle on here. And that is a U1 bundle now to as many boundary components as it has. So for example, this guy here, it's a U1 to the fourth bundle over this type of space. OK, very good. So, Let's uh, just uh, exercise a little bit. What happens for a pair of pants? Well, it's well known that the type of space for a pair of pants, so this type of space here, is simply just R plus to the three. The hyperbolic structure is exactly determined by the length of the three geodesics that constitutes its boundary. So that's the map from here to here. It's totally canonical. And if I now do the space that I have just introduced with the P here, then that will be R plus cross R to the three. So there is this extra twist parameter around the boundary. And if I divide out by boundary parallel and Dane twist, I get this space here, R plus plus U1 to the 3. And of course, I want to denote the coordinates Li and theta i, just the, the length is Li and the twist parameter is theta i. So I have these six coordinates on a pair of pants. OK, very good. So now what I have to do in order to really prove that it's a target theory, I have to tell you how do I get a disjoint union morphism and how do I get a gluing morphism. So let's exercise a little bit with that. So I have two surfaces with boundary and with these mark points. Now I take beta, some set of things that I would like to glue, like over here. So the beta from before, this gluing data, and I look at the glued surface. So, but if the, in the first instance, I can look at the following inclusion. If you take the subset of type model space of the disjoint union, where the lengths of the boundaries that I want to glue on agree, that's a sub-variety inside just the type of space of digital union, right? Those are exactly the ones that are ready to be glued. And because I have these marked points, when I glue, there is a well-defined you know, gluing process that gives me a well-defined hyperbolic structure by just gluing mark points to mark points. And so there is a way to take this space here and map it to the glued surface. Because if I have a hyperbolic surface, here and a hyperbolic surface here, and the length of the boundaries agree, and our geodesics, I can just glue them and get a new hyperbolic structure on the whole thing. So that's this map from here to there. And now what we notice is that if you first did twist this way before you glue on that side of the boundary, and this way on the other boundary that you're gluing on, and when you glue, this can be undone when you have glued. So therefore, I can actually afford to divide out by the Dean twist, the subgroup, of Dean twists, which go one way on one side and the other way on the other side of the pairs that I'm gluing on. And so this thing here will be a U1 to the number of components I'm gluing on, or pairs of components I'm gluing on, over that space. So it's just a nice bundle over the glued, type of space of the glued surface. Very good. So now, the disjoint union morphism. Well, the disjoint union morphism is very, very simple, right? Because the type of space of the disjoint union of the two surfaces, of course, has two projections to one surface or the other. So I just take and two functions, because my target theory is continuous functions on type of space, right? So I just pull back from one side, pull back from the other side, and take the product. This is a bilinear map of C0, I mean, of continuous functions. Okay. Very good. So that part is trivial. That's the gluing morphism. Uh, sorry, the, the digital gluing morphism. The gluing morphism. Well, what I do now is I just take two functions, which are continuous functions on the two type of spaces of two surfaces. Then I first restrict it to where the lengths agree that I want to glue on. And then on that space, that was this U1 bundle. And so I just integrate the result along this U1 fibers with respect to some rotation invariant measure that gives the fiber volume one. So that's the gluing morphism. Okay. 
And so now, in the, what is initial data here? Well, initial data is two functions, A and C, which are continuous functions on the type one space of the pair of hands, which are Markov class will be very that just simply translates into continuous functions on R plus cross U1 to the three that are invariant under the switching the last two arguments, <coughs> sets of arguments. B and B prime are just two arbitrary continuous functions on this space, but they have to be related in such a way that if I switch again the last pair corresponding to switching the two boundaries uh, of the outs, then they interchange. And then D is something that is a function that's continuous in the type of space of one whole torus, which is multi class quadratic. And then, here is the precise admissibility condition that these functions have to satisfy. So let's look at that. What it says is that you look at the subset of type of space for which the systole is bigger than epsilon. So there is no simple closed curve on the surface that has lengths smaller than epsilon. Look at that subset. And so on that subset, you need to have a uniform estimate that says that if you take one plus the positive part of the length of the plus boundary minus the length of the minus boundary and lift that to the S and multiply onto the absolute value of the B function, and that's uniformly bounded, only depending on S and, S and epsilon. So it's uniformly bounded on systole sets. And this is for all S bigger than zero, so for all powers. And the same thing for C, like this. This plus guy is just the positive part of this difference. So it's zero if this difference is negative, and it is equal to this difference if the difference is positive. This here is the precise analytic estimate that these two functions, B and C, has to satisfy. A and D, there are absolutely no constraint that can be arbitrary. And so the theorem is that, oh, sorry, the theorem is that if you have initial data that satisfies these constraints, you can run geometric recursion for the Tychmanov theory, Tychmanov theory, Tychmanov space, and you will get a continuous function on Tychmanov space of all surfaces that is Markov class could be variant. Okay, so now let's try to do this one here. So this is the Miyazakani machine uh, initial data, and there are very good reasons why this exactly these two. But A is the function 1, B is this expression here, C is that expression, and D is simply you sum over all simple closed curves on a one-hole torus, and you do this to C. Okay, so you take this one-hole torus, like this, and then for every simple closed curve on the surface, you will record its length with respect to some point in the Teichmuller space of the torus, and then you just compute, you evaluate the C this way. And you sum. And so, a theorem, first of all, D is a well-defined function, continuous on Tychmanov space of one whole torus, and uh, this is the result. So if you run the geometric recursion with this initial data here, you will get the function one on Tychmanov space. And this is repeated applications of Miyazakani's uh, proof of machine identity for all surfaces. Okay. So, so her work is highly non-trivial, but when you combine that with this and set up the recursion this way, you get exactly this identity here. You always get one. So but this is a kind of partition of unity, you should think of it that way. It's not a trivial result. I'll show you in a second. Okay. Uh, one thing you can do to this initial data is you can scale it this way here. Just take a beta and scale your arguments and evaluate the initial data on the result and let beta go to infinity. It's a kind of tropicalization of this initial data. And if you tropicalize Miyazakani McShane initial data, you get Kontsevich initial data, which is these ones here. And then D is, has the same formula, but now with, with this C here. And then you can ask, what happens if you do this? And the reason why we call it Kontsevich initial data is this theorem here that if you run the geometric recursion for this initial data here, then first of all, this initial data satisfies what it needs to. You will get a continuous function on these moduli spaces. And if you restrict it to the subspace where the lengths are, are fixed and multiply it onto the usual Liouville measure of that Teichmuller space, and you average over Teichmuller space, you will exactly get the integral over mg and bar of x of the psi classes 
but multiplied by the length of the square half. So, in other words, these guys here determine these, and these guys here determine these. And so, of course, these are the ones that, that uh, Maxim worked with when he proved the Williams conjecture. Okay, so that's another example where that you can, so I show you now two examples from psychology. Yes? So, does this here imply something about the initial data for the torus? Uh, because you say all of them are yeah, yes, one, yes, it does. Don't start with yes, all of them. yes, it actually computes what this is integrated. So it gi it gives you the usual formula, whatever it is, pi over twelve plus something. I forget what it is. Yes. So so this theorem here tells you because these are known explicitly for low g and n. Okay. In fact, these guys here satisfy topological recursion. And so maybe I just, uh, let me see. Yeah, I'm actually out of time. So uh, maybe I simply stop here. But I will tell you that, that I will get very quickly to how geometric recursion and topological recursion relate when I start next time, tomorrow. Okay, so thank you. We do have one way to lift your relations to relations in the setting here, and that's a way we get invariance on the you know switching around negative and positive boundaries. Uh, so we do have a way to lift them. Uh, yeah. So we do have relations in, in this case also, but the thing is that it also works in this case with no relations whatsoever. Other question? So, so this theory of geometric recursion that you're developing kind of reminds at least me a little bit of the continued fraction recursion for uh, national numbers. Yeah. Because of course it stops at yeah. finitely many steps. Yes. So um, I'm wondering how these categories and these constructions behave when you apply uh, finite index covers between surfaces because the, the way that you would sort of extend this quote continued fraction yes. process uh -huh. to irrational objects would be to take a kind of inverse limit of this category of surfaces that you're studying right. with respect to finite covers because they induce on type space a direct limit of inclusions. Yes, I see. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if, um, I mean, just how does this construction behave with respect to finite covers? Yes, I, I don't know because we didn't think about it at all. Okay. But it could be very interesting to try to understand those limits. Uh, because, I mean, one uh, big sort of open question about this is that um, if one looks at uh, the work, what, what Kutsevich and Soiberman is doing, and also what Bertrand is doing, then one sometimes gets equations that the whole sum over G and M satisfies. Okay, and, and that's sort of manifestly built in in what Kutsevich and Sogerman are doing. And in this case here, we haven't really sort of been able to find a home for that because you have vector space associated to all the surfaces, right, depending on G and N. And so you would somehow want to try to understand that you impose more things, that there are inclusions of these spaces as you enlarge G and N in some way, right. and then you have some kind of limiting space on which that could live in and satisfy some relation there. Yeah, exactly. Which is sort of the same as the loop equation, right. uh, you know, or the, yeah, from from quantum field theory. So, so I don't know. I mean, it, it's very interesting questions we haven't really pursued at the moment. It's one surface at a time, but I think it's sure. very natural to consider the whole family of surfaces under some kind of inductive system. Right. right. Yeah. Other questions? No, it's not. Let's thank the speaker again.